Well, tonight we're going to begin a study, as you see, in uh, biblical cosmology. And uh, this is a study that, to be quite honest with you, I had never intended to offer a study on this particular subject. But Timothy and five other people who are either members or visitors of our church over the last year and a half, Timothy said three years, uh, have asked me numerous questions uh, about things related to this subject. And so that's why we're going to have the study that we're going to have on biblical cosmology. Um, I I do want to say at the outset uh, tonight, we're going to do things a little differently than I normally do a Sunday evening Bible study. I will not be taking questions or comments during the presentation, but hold those until the end of the presentation, and then every evening when we finish, we'll take questions and comments and and all at that point. So if you think of something, uh, write it down, jot it down so you don't forget what it is, and also you might want to take notes as we go through if there are some things that you uh, see that you want to go back and revisit or do some research on your own. And I think that you'll enjoy it as we go through. You see, the first slide here is biblical cosmology, what the Bible says and doesn't say. You know, the Bible is supposed to be our our final authority in every area of life, not just in theology, but in every area of life. We've talked about this numerous times. If the Bible uh, makes a statement on any subject, it's authoritative and it's 100% accurate. We believe that the entire Word of God is the very Word of God from uh, beginning to end, all 66 books. So even when the Bible talks about things regarding history, you can uh, go ahead and mark it down. Whatever it says about those historical facts are true, even if historians have not yet caught up to those things and realized that they're true. There have been numerous examples over the last hundred years or so where historians and archaeologists believe that some of the things that are mentioned in the Old Testament, for example, could not have possibly happened, couldn't possibly be true, and some of the uh, groups of people listed there never even existed. They were just made up, only to find out uh, years and years later, of course, that uh, archaeology uh, has uncovered proof that they actually existed, and that everything the Bible says happened just the way the Bible said. So whether it's history or if it's science, if the Bible speaks to a matter regarding something in science, you can go ahead and just mark it down. It's going to be true even if it differs with what modern science says. And of course, the subject that we're going to be studying, biblical cosmology, is science. It's about the creation of the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, and how they all fit together into the universe that God has made, how they interact with one another. And you already know that modern scientists disagree in many points with the Word of God. And so it should not come as any shock to you, any surprise to you, that the things we're going to see in cosmology that they believe also disagree with the Bible. But uh, we'll begin our study now with uh, a few things uh, starting out as introductory information. These are several passages of Scripture that you see up here. The first one is 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. You probably have memorized this at some point. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So this verse simply says that anything the Bible says, it is the very Word of God. The second one is 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now this verse is important because it is the basis for uh, the fact that we take Scripture literally. Unless the Bible says to do otherwise, we take everything in this book to be literal. And now there are, of course, some passages in the New Testament where Jesus says these are parables. There are some instances in the first chapter of the book of Revelation 
where the Bible says these are symbols, and then it tells us what they're symbols, what those items are symbols for. But unless the Bible says to do otherwise explicitly, we take everything in this book to be literal. The next verse, 1 Timothy 6.20, O Timothy, not that Timothy, but the Timothy Paul was writing to in the first century, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. Paul says, uh, avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science. But notice he, de- he describes the science he's referring to as falsely so-called. In other words, there are some things that call themselves science, some things that mankind calls science that's not real science. It's, uh, uh, it's kind of voodoo magic stuff, but it's not real science. So... Uh, These are the basic principles we're going to begin with. All Scripture is inspired by God. Uh, We're to take it literally and keep in mind there are things that purport to be science that are not actual science. Then look at these two verses. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. There are some things we're going to talk about over the next eight weeks that I'm just going to be honest with you. If if I just made those statements and gave you no context, they would totally, totally shock you because they are going to totally disagree with what modern science has to say about the sun, the moon, the stars, and the earth all. But what's important is that we consider whether they're scriptural. What the Bible says, again, has to be the final authority. Romans 3, 4, Let God be true, but every man a liar. So the things we see from Scripture, whether we understand it or not, we're going to believe it to be the Word of God. And we're going to take it at face value and assume that what God says is true, even if it is contradicted by modern science. That's the assumption the preacher is going to make anyway. You can make that decision for yourself. All right, here's the biblical pledge. I agree to accept the Word of God as the final authority and to accept what it says as the truth even when I don't completely understand it, even when it contradicts what I was taught in school, even when it contradicts what I see and hear on radio and television. Uh, By the way, we could say the big screen in Hollywood also. Even when it contradicts what my friends and family believe. Even when it contradicts what big name preachers say. And even when it contradicts what scientists and so-called experts say. Now, you don't have to take this pledge, but uh, I would strongly encourage you to take this pledge internally That is, whatever the Bible says, we're going to let it speak for itself and let the chips fall where they may. We're going to accept the Bible as being true even when it's contradicted by science. Did you mean to leave out that uh, saying that uh, what Washington, D.C. says? Uh, That's a very good point, Brother John. We could just as easily include that even when it contradicts. Oh, there it is. I didn't mean to leave it out. You're right. Even when it contradicts what Washington, D.C. says. I want us to look at several of the different subjects where we know we've already talked about before that science, that is modern science, falsely so called, disagrees, differs from the Bible. One of these that we've talked about before is the origin of animal life. Modern science says all animal life evolved over time from different kinds beginning with the simplest. That is, in a nutshell, what evolution says. It started with little one-celled something or another's that somehow uh, turned into some kind of slime that eventually crawled up out of the the pool of primordial uh, ooze that was there. And uh, it eventually turned into simple animal life and and eventually evolved into all of the different types of animals 
uh, on the earth. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say that animal life got here by things evolving from each other and a bunch of nothing to begin with. It says, uh, Genesis 1.25, that every kind of creature was created exactly as it is today in six days. It says, And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Genesis 1.25. So you see what science says, modern science, and you see what the Bible says. The question then is, which do you believe? I hope your answer is the Bible. The next question is, uh, why do you believe it? Hopefully the answer is because the Bible says so. Uh, If the Bible says it, that's the answer. Here's another topic of discussion for science that you already hopefully know uh, this is an area where modern science is wrong. It's the origin of human life. Modern science says man evolved from primates, particularly the apes. Chimpanzees, uh, orangutans, uh, gorillas, the apes. That's what modern science says. But the Bible says man is created in the image of God as a living soul. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And so what modern science says about how mankind got here, totally at odds with what the Bible says. And our young people that uh, when they go to government schools, they're bombarded from uh, first grade all the way through university Uh, that man evolved from other things. But that's not. But that's not what the Bible says. And uh, the question then, which do you believe? Hopefully you believe that God created man in his own image and he did not evolve from something else. Uh, Hold all your questions, if you would, until the end. Uh, Just jot yourself a note so uh, you remember what it is and we'll come back to it. And so... Which do you believe? Hopefully you believe we were created in God's image. Why do you believe that? Well, the answer should be because the Bible says so. The next subject, the chicken or the egg. I guess you're all familiar with the old riddle, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, if you say the chicken, well, where did the chicken come from? I guess it came from an egg. Well, where did the egg come from? I think that was a comedy routine with either the Three Stooges or somebody way back there in the 20s or 30s. But modern science says the earth looks old, so it must be millions or billions of years old. Now, some of the modern scientists say that the earth is approximately 45 billion years old. That's what modern science says. It looks old, so it must be millions or billions of years old. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says God created the earth about 6,000 years ago. But He created it with the appearance of age. That is, He made it just 6,000 years ago, but He made it so that it looked older than 6,000 years. He created trees, not mere seeds in the ground. He created Adam as a full-grown man not a baby, and hence he created the chicken and not the egg. So the earth and all of creation was created with the appearance of age. The act of creation with the appearance of age explains many of the things which may otherwise have made no sense if one only considered the evolutionist's premise. So if you are only going by the way it looks... Well, it looks like it could be older than 6,000 years perhaps, but the Bible tells us and explains very clearly that God created all that He created with the appearance of being full grown, the appearance of age. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? The chicken came first. Science versus the Bible. If science disagrees with the Bible on other subjects, issues, matters, Which are you going to believe? Well, I hope that you're going to agree with the Bible on other things. 
if science disagrees with the Bible. We've talked about the origin of animal life, the origin of human life. We've talked about the age of the earth. We know that science contradicts the Bible on all three of those. I believe, knowing the audience to whom I'm speaking, you don't believe that animals evolved from something else. And you don't believe that mankind evolved from apes or something else. And you don't believe that the earth is billions and billions of years old like modern science says. You believe what you believe because it's what the Bible says. So over the next few weeks, you're going to be exposed to some things in the Bible that maybe you've noticed before. I strongly suspect some of them you have not ever paid attention to before. And those things also contradict what modern science says. So the challenge is when you're confronted with something new that you've never seen before for yourself, you've never noticed it before, but the Bible says it, even if it contradicts what modern science says, I hope you're still going to go with what the Bible says. Even if you don't understand it, even if you don't know how it could be that way, and even if it goes against everything you've been taught since daycare, I hope you'll still say, whatever the Bible says, that's what it is. Let's get started. The definition of cosmology is the study of the nature of the universe. So over the next seven weeks after tonight, you're going to hear things about the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, how they all interact with each other, how they're all formed, how they are situated, where they are, what they are. And there are going to be lots of things that you're going to see from Scripture that I strongly suspect you've never noticed before because we're going to put them all together. Lie number one, the origin of the universe. Modern science says everything was created by a big bang. But the Bible says everything was created by God. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. So, lie number one is the origin of the universe. Scientists say everything was created by a big bang. Now they can't explain what the big bang was what caused the Big Bang, where it came from, and whatever it was that banged, where it came from. But that's what they say is the origin of the universe. They say it all started in something that was probably so small it could fit on the head of a pin. And it exploded into everything there is in the universe. The Big Bang. But of course you and I know the Bible says everything was created by God. So... The origin of the universe. What are you going to believe? I hope you're going to believe that it was created by God in six literal days like the Bible says. God created the heaven and the earth. Lie number two. The length of creation of the universe. Now here's Carl Sagan up here. Uh, you might recognize him if you're old enough. Modern science says the universe has evolved over billions and billions of years. Carl Sagan is famous for saying billions and billions of years, so that's why that's up there. Uh, but that's what he, he's just a spokesman for the rest of the evolutionists, the atheists. Uh, they say the universe has evolved over billions of years. But the Bible says God created everything in six literal days. It didn't take billions of years for it to get the way it is. It didn't take millions of years for the earth to get the way it is or for it to spin off of the sun or for the sun to spin off of some larger star or anomaly that's out there. But rather, God made everything there is in six literal days about 6,000 years ago. Genesis 2 verses 1 and 2 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. When it says all the host of them, that means everything that is in the heavens and everything that's on the earth. And on the seventh day, God ended His work which He had made, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had made. Lie number two, the length of 
creation of the universe. It did not take millions or billions of years. It took six days. Lie number three. The order of creation of the earth. Now, this is very important because a simple reading of the book of Genesis is clearly at odds with a lot of what evolution teaches about the Big Bang. So let's just look literally at what the book of Genesis says in chapter 1. Modern science says the earth came into existence after the sun and the stars. In fact, most uh, modern scientists will tell you that the earth was somehow spun off of the sun and later the moon was somehow spun off of the earth. But they say that the earth came into existence after the sun and all the stars were already out there. And that all the other planets, so-called, that are out there in the heaven, uh, that they all came into being after their stars were in existence. But that's not what the Bible says. Look what the Bible says. Uh, The earth was created on day, what? One. The first day, God created the heaven and the earth on day one. While the sun and stars weren't created until day four according to Genesis 1, verses 14 through 19. So here are the verses. Look what it says. Uh, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So there's no way that the earth came out of the sun or came out as a result of any of the stars because the earth was here before the sun, the moon, and the stars. So if you believe your Bible, you immediately have to acknowledge that not only what they say about evolution on the earth is wrong, but they've got all of it wrong about cosmology because they think the sun, the moon, and the star, uh, they think the sun and the stars were here before the earth was here. They've got it backwards. And if you start with a wrong premise, your model's going to be totally wrong. Nothing's going to fit together right because you you got the premise wrong to begin with. Lie number three, the order of the creation of the earth. Earth was created on day one. The sun, the moon, and the stars were created on day four. So the earth could not have come from those things. Lie number four, the origin of day and night. Now, modern science would tell you that the sun creates the light that provides day on the earth. In other words, there's day and night because of the sun. And yet that's not what the Bible says. Look what the Bible says. The Bible says light and daytime existed before the sun, which did not come into being until day four. We just read the verses where the sun was created on day four, The moon was created on day four. The stars were created on day four. That totally contradicts uh, or goes against what modern science says. They're actually the ones contradicting the Bible. It was around first. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. So there didn't have to be a sun or a moon for there to be day and night. They didn't come around on the scene until day four. The Bible says there was already day and night starting with the first day. The Bible also says, as you saw for yourself, there was light on day one. Modern science says the sunlight that, uh, that it's sunlight that produces daytime. 
That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says there was light on day one. He called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Somebody might ask, well, where did the light come from? Where was the light if it wasn't produced by the sun? Well, the Bible tells us that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. I submit to you that if He chose to, uh, the light could have come directly from the throne of God upon the earth. But from wherever He sent the light, it was here on day one. He didn't wait until day four when the sun and the moon were created. So lie number four, the origin of day and night. Are you seeing already that what modern science says is totally wrong? There's nothing about their model that so far that we've looked at is correct. They are building a model based on their presuppositions, their theology, their religion that there is no God. But if you take the Bible literally, uh, none of what they say could be true. Light was around three days before the sun. Daniel 2.22 says, He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I strongly suspect that light on day one came from the very throne of God and God Himself. Why number five. The origin of plant life. (coughs) Now this is very important, so uh, try to follow what it says. Modern science says plants evolved with the help of the sun. Now, why does it say that? Modern science says that because plants need sunlight to produce the chlorophyll, which is the, the food for the plant. Now, if modern science was correct, the sun would had to have come first to produce sunlight for those whatever they were that started growing that evolved into basic plant life and eventually the complex plant life that we see all over the earth. There would have to have already been sunlight for plant life to evolve. But notice what the Bible says. The Bible says plants were created on day three. And the sun wasn't created until day four, according to Genesis chapter 1. You say, well, that's no big deal because that's just one day's difference. But yeah, that's not what the evolutionists say. The evolutionists say this took place over millions of years, not one day. By the way, there are some so-called creationists who want to monkey around with the Bible like the evolutionist, and they say, well, when the Bible says the earth was created in six days, it could be six periods. And maybe each one of those periods are a thousand years, or a million years, or a billion years long. That the six days of creation are not six literal 24-hour days. Well, this right here totally destroys that possibility. Plants could not have existed without sunlight for a thousand years or two thousand years or a million years. You either have to believe the Bible for what it says or you're left with no explanation at all. The Bible says here in uh, the book of Genesis chapter 1, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. So plant life existed on the earth before the sun was here uh, to create the chlorophyll. Lie number six. The sun and the moon. All right, here's where it's just beginning to get exciting, Timothy. Modern science says moonlight is merely a reflection of sunlight. But the Bible says that the sun and the moon are two separate sources of light, according to Genesis 1. So here's Genesis 1 beginning in verse 14. We've read it before, but let's look at it again. 
Keeping in mind, we're looking at what it says about the sun and the moon. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Notice here it says in verse 16, God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. Modern science says that the moon is not a light. It's simply a uh, body up there in the sky that reflects the sun's light. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that the moon itself is a light. It's not the greater light, it's the lesser light, but it's one of the two great lights. A reflection of the sun's light. This is a humorous photo, but on the left there you see an astronaut uh, holding a globe. You see that it says this is what a sphere, a round uh, body, looks like when it reflects light. You see the little... You see the little dot of light. That's not what it looks like, a picture of the moon. If you took a solid body that was a, a ball, a sphere, and you shined a light on it, it would not look like the moon. It would not be totally lit up from our vantage point. Only the part where the sun was directly hitting it, that spot, that, that small area that was parallel to the earth, that's where we would see a reflection of the light. We wouldn't see a reflection of the light from the rest of that sphere because the light would be hitting it and bouncing off in every other direction, not back toward us. Only that small area would be bouncing back toward us. If the moon were a reflection of the sun's light, that's what it would look like, not this. The nature of the moon. Preacher, I don't believe what you're saying. I believe that science says that the moon is a reflector of the sun. It's not a light in and of itself. All right, let's see what the Bible says. The moon is a completely separate luminary from the sun with its own light. And its light is different than that of the sun. Look at Psalm 104, 19. He appointed the moon for seasons. The sun knoweth his going down. Isaiah 13, 10. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. You're going to see as we look at these different passages of Scripture, the sun is referred to as a he or a him or his. The moon is referred to as the opposite of the sun. But it says the moon shall not cause her light to shine. It says her light because the moon has light of its own. It's not a reflection of the sun's light. Isaiah 30 verse 26, Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun. And the light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of seven days in the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of His people. So here again talking about the moon having its own light. Jeremiah 31, 35, Thus saith the Lord which giveth the sun for a light by day and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night. So the moon, again the moon has its own light, is its own light. Ezekiel 32, 7. And when I shall put thee out, I will cover the heaven and make the stars thereof dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. 
The sun shall, uh, Joel 2.31, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Mark 13, 24, you can't see it there, it's cut off. Let me see if I can see it on mine. I can't see uh, the very bottom of it, but it says the moon shall not give her light. So the point of this is that Scripture over and over talks about the moon having her own light not being a reflector of the sun's light, but different, with a different character of light. Look at this, the nature of moonlight. Moonlight is very different than sunlight. In fact, in some respects, it displays properties which are the exact opposite of the characteristics or properties of sunlight. Now, let me stop before we read the rest of it and say this. If moonlight was merely a reflection of sunlight, then the properties of sunlight and the properties of moonlight would be identical. It might be dimmer, might be less intense, but the properties of the light itself, the rays of light, would still be the same. Because light rays uh, coming from the sun would be the, 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 the rays which would be bouncing off and coming to the earth. Sunlight gives off heat. It causes the production of vitamin D in the human body, and it results in photosynthesis in plant life, and it promotes good mental health. It's just a fact, uh, folks that uh, are down, depressed, whatever, they, they need a certain amount of sunlight, or they're not going to come out of whatever it is. It's the reason that in those, uh, those countries where it stays dark so much of the year, they have abnormally high levels of depression and even suicide because that people need sunlight. But look at the nature of moonlight. Moonlight does not produce heat. It lends toward the process of decay and putrefaction. And it does not help uh, provide with depression for depression and anxiety like sunlight. Some experiments, in fact many experiments, have even yielded results which show that direct moonlight causes objects to be colder than portions of the same object which are in moon shade. Little scientific work has been done by the so-called professionals to study the differences between sunlight and moonlight. I strongly suspect it's because they don't want to know the difference and they don't want you to know that there's a difference. You can, you can even do this study for yourself or you can, you can find or read about or observe others that have done these tests. You can watch them do it uh, or you can do it yourself. Those, uh, those thermometers they have now that are kind of like laser th thermometers where you aim it at something, pull the trigger, and it tells you the temperature reading of an object as well as a person. Um, you can you can take the temperature of something that is in direct moonlight and it will be colder, colder than if you cover that object, obscure that object so that the moonlight isn't hitting it directly and it's in the shade of the moon's light. It will be warmer in the shade of the moon's light than it is in direct moonlight. Why? Because moonlight is the exact opposite of sunlight. Moonlight is by nature cold. Sunlight is warming. They have two totally different properties. Anyway, you can do the test for yourself or you can see where somebody else has done the test. For some reason, my text isn't showing up here. So I'll tell you what these two objects represent, the sun and the moon. You see that they are, they appear to be the same size. If you look at them in the sky, which by the way, there was one day uh, just about a week ago, oh, I went to the grocery store in the middle of the afternoon to get me a, uh, a bottled water, and I noticed the sun was over here high in the sky, and the moon was over here high in the sky at the same time. 
And they look to be the exact same size in the, in the sky. Modern science says that the sun, though, is 400 times larger than the moon. But the reason it appears to be the exact same size is because it just happens that they say the sun is also 400 times farther away than the moon. And that's why they coincidentally look the exact same size in the sky. Now, as we get into some other things over the next few weeks, you're going to see why they have come up with the supposition that the sun is 93 million miles away and the moon is much closer to that. But what our eyes tell us, what our natural senses tell us is that they're both about the same distance from the earth and that they're both about the same size in the sky. The only reason that modern science has come up with the theory that the sun is 93 million miles away, 400 times farther away than the moon, but 400 times larger than the moon, is that it has to be to make their model of the universe work. But what your senses would tell you is that isn't true. They're the same size and approximately the same distance, whatever that is, from the earth. It all goes back to what we talked about two years or better ago when we talked about Mystery Babylon. The religion of the Antichrist that will be here during the tribulation that started way back at the Tower of Babel. Back at the Tower of Babel, they were already involved with worshiping the sun, the moon, and the stars. I don't have time to reteach all of that on Mystery Babylon. It's online. You can go to the church's website and watch and listen to those presentations that we did back then on Mystery Babylon. But the worship of the sun was supposed to represent the worship of Nimrod, for those of you that were in that study. Nimrod supposedly ascended up to the sun, became one with the sun, and that's why the people there at the Tower of Babel worshipped the sun. And of course, when God uh, confounded the languages and people spread throughout the entire earth like they were supposed to do in the first place, they all took with them this false religion that started at the Tower of Babel. And that's why universally on the earth, every ancient civilization worshipped the sun as the premier god of the deities. It's something they learned at the Tower of Babel. And then you remember though that Nimrod, his wife slash mother, uh, she said that she came from the moon in a brightly colored moon egg that descended to the Euphrates River. She was worshipped, Semiramis, in all of those ancient religions as the moon goddess. So you had the sun god and the moon goddess. I know when I was in college, I went on a mission trip down to Mexico and they have uh, those two big stepped pyramids there. The largest is the pyramid, uh, the Sol Pyramid, S-O-L. Uh, it's the pyramid to the sun god. And the slightly smaller stepped pyramid off to the side was the pyramid to the moon goddess. Every ancient civilization worshipped the sun as the preeminent deity. Why is there seemingly an intentional design among modern scientists to credit the sun with all the light that there is when we know there was light, the Bible says, before the sun was created on day four? Well, number one, it's because the Bible clearly states that light was created before the sun. And number two, the Bible clearly states that the moon is a light unto herself. It is not a reflection of the sun. Why then the intentional deception by modern science to give credit to the sun in excess of the truth? Why is modern science still trying to get people to give all the credit to the sun for everything? There's a reason. 
It's because modern science is just as much tied into the worship of the sun and the sun god and the mystery Babylon religion that's coming that's already here but it's going to be manifest in the tribulation period. Modern science is just as much involved in it as all those international corporations where we looked at all their corporate logos that promote the sun and sun worship. They are initiating the masses of humanity into sun worship. That's the reason for the intentional deception. The sun worship has its roots in the mystery religion founded at the Tower of Babel. The dead Nimrod was proclaimed by his wife slash mother Semiramis to have been resurrected from the dead and to have ascended to the sun where he became one with the celestial body as the solar deity. The rays from the sun then were credited by Semiramis with the miraculous conception of her child, Tammuz in a satanic counterfeit of the miracle of the virgin birth of Christ, which had been foretold to Adam and Eve. Since that time, every civilization which spread from Babel took with it the worship of the sun, as the exalted Nimrod, Baal, Ra, and a dozen other names from diverse cultures. The worship of the virgin mother and infant child usually accompanies the worship of the sun. This is Mystery Babylon. It's the religion that's as old as the Tower of Babel. And modern science is simply doing their part to promote the worship of the sun, the false god. Sun worship today, everywhere one looks, religions, governments, secret societies, and international corporations today use the symbol of the sun. As the religious and commercial aspects of the coming Mystery Babylon religion of the Antichrist are initiating the masses into the ancient mystery religion of Illuminism through subtle mind control. You know, objects or symbols have power. Symbols have the ability to convey a message even if I don't tell you what it's a symbol of. Speech therapist psychologists have done lots of studies of how certain symbols automatically in the human mind convey certain certain ideas. So that even if you haven't been told ahead of time what it's supposed to represent, certain symbols already put thoughts into your mind. What is happening is that the religion of Illuminism The religion of the worship of the sun that started at the Tower of Babel is being pushed on humanity in preparation for the day of the Antichrist and his false prophet and his one world religion. That brings us to the end of our presentation for tonight. You already have been confronted with some things that I have no doubt totally contradict what you were taught in school. Some of those things you've already come to grips with before tonight and you already know that they're false. Animal life didn't evolve from amoebas. Human life didn't evolve from monkeys or apes or something else. The earth is not really billions and billions of years old. You already knew those things, even though they contradict what science tells you. But you've also heard some other things tonight from the Word of God that totally contradict what modern science says about the sun, about the moon, and folks, we're just getting started. The stuff that is yet to come will be totally, totally different than what you've been taught in the science textbooks growing up. But if the Word of God says it, it's true. Preacher, I'm not sure I'm convinced yet. Hold on to your seat. Be back next week. It's going to be more exciting than it was tonight as we dive in more in depth next week. So at this point, I'll take any questions or comments or observations yet.